Thank you so much for joining this session. And、uh, my name is Mei Wang. I'm from Palo Alto Networks. I like to share my journey today, E to E. It's not end to end, but、uh, how to from、uh, engineer to entrepreneur. We started a company. I started a company called Zingbox five years ago together with my two co-founders, and was acquired by Palo Alto Networks late last year. It was a roller coaster journey. And Zingbox at Zingbox, we provide we use machine learning to provide. Security solutions to protect IoT devices in enterprises or the connected devices in enterprises. And I found this、uh, startup experience has lots of similarities to many things in our life. For example, I feel the startup was more like another kid I had, and has shares lots of、uh, commonality with raising kids. So that itself can be another long talk by itself. And some of our entrepreneur friends would vent to each other often. And、uh, one of the CEOs was saying, was joking that he actually applied his CEO skills on his girlfriend, set the right expectation, set the right milestone, and frequent reviews and proper rewards. Not too much, not too many, not too much, not too little, etc. So anyway, I. I hope by sharing my, I'm going to share my journey, talk about entrepreneur life, and then at the end give some advice or more like lessons learned. I hope this will encourage some of you to chase your dream, and also can learn from my mistakes. So my journey was very simple. I before Zingbox, I was at Cisco for. Fourteen years, I was at Cisco CT office. Did、uh, many very interesting technical projects, and、uh, as I mentioned, five years ago we started Zingbox and went through from scratch to build the product,、uh, build the team, acquire customers, sell to customers, and then eventually sold to Palo Alto Networks. And、uh, I was always a very quiet engineer. I always thought I only know how to talk to computers, never know how to talk to human beings. Still don't know. And I'm very grateful to all the people help us allow help us out through this very tough journey. Partners, team members, our investors, our customers. And before I started Zingbox, I often encourage friends and people around me to go out of your comfort zone, chase your dream, start your own company, etc. And only after the Zingbox journey, now the advice I give to people is: whoever you hate, encourage him to start a company because it's really inhumane. Only in hindsight, I realize I'm probably the last person in the whole planet to start a company. And because I've met with so many entrepreneurs, I've seen so many entrepreneurs, and here are some characteristics I discovered, I observed among all these successful entrepreneurs. And I feel myself as the opposite to every single one of them. For example, most entrepreneurs are very adventurous. They like to take risks. They like to try new things. But myself, I'm very risk averse. I was in big company for 14 years. I never ever worked in a startup. And、uh, I was always follow the rules. I was always a good kid and play everything safe. I got my PhD, which stands for permanent head damage. So with that kind of damage, it's even worse. And lots of entrepreneurs very experienced. And I said, not I, I never ever even worked at a startup. And that was Zingbox was my first、uh, startup experience. 
And most entrepreneurs are extroverted. They're super outgoing, super social. And then I realized there's a reason for that because when you start a company, when you build a company, you have to talk to gazillions of people and uh, you talk to people every day. You talk to all kinds of people every day. Well, for me, I, the opposite. I'm usually invisible at parties and events, but, uh, for Zingbox, I turns out I had to speak a lot representing the company and I'm very soft spoken. I usually have very low voice and actually my coworkers at uh, Cisco used to joke with me that they were saying, oh, May, I think you should be a CIA agent because you're always whispering as if you're telling something very secretive. And because I have to speak a lot for Zingbox and most people can't even hear me every time before I get onto stage, I have to talk to the audio guy. Oh, if you don't hear from my mic, then just crank up the volume. I remember once I was uh, getting onto a big stage. It was a big event. I did my usual thing, talk to the audio guy. And uh, this audio person told me, May, let me tell you a trick. You just imagine everybody in the audience is your husband and your kids. And when you get so mad at them, just yell at them. That's how you get your volumes up. I was like, hey, I can do that. I've been practicing that every day at home. And another trade I found in, among entrepreneurs, they're usually super aggressive and I'm very, I'm the opposite. I, I'm never very aggressive. I'm always the, the last person to speak if I ever speak anything. And being the only woman in the room is not helpful either. For the past five years, I was always the only woman in our board meeting in the boardroom. And when we were doing fundraising, when I was doing fundraising together with our CEO, two of us went to meet with uh, many, many VCs and Sand Hills, and almost all of them are men, except once we walk into a VC's conference room and uh, a woman partner walk in. And the first thing she said, and they specialize in investing in security startups. And the first thing she said was, we have invested in cybersecurity startups for the past 12 years. And you are the first female founder sitting in this boardroom. And I was saying the same thing back to her. We talked to so many VCs and you are the very first female VC partner we've ever talked to. And another trade I found uh, among entrepreneurs is uh, they're usually very optimistic and I'm the paranoid one. Even before sky is falling, before anything's falling, I was always worried and uh, concerned and uh, trying to, if we get 99 out of 100, I always try to find out what's the other uh, 1%. And most entrepreneurs are very energetic, but I'm the person I need my eight hours sleep. I still don't exercise, even though that has been on my to-do list for, uh, or New Year's resolution for the past 20 years. And I'm still not giving up on that. I'm still trying, hopefully in the future, one day I'll start exercising. And there are two things about startup, very, very important. One is the speed of execution. Another one is uh, commitment. And when it comes to speed, I'm a perfectionist. I often spend 80% of my effort to perfect that 20% uh, performance. And when it comes to commitment, especially in hindsight, I realized that was the probably, not only I'm probably the worst person to start a company, but that was probably the worst time in my life to start a company. First, needless to mention, when I started a company five years ago, I was at the age that most lots of young people in software industry are probably in their retirement years. You know, people, uh, make big bucks in uh, Facebook, Google, they retire in their early thirties, but now I'm just starting my entrepreneur journey. And uh, my kids were, my two kids were very, very young. And also I had to take care of my two aiding parents. I remember there were times 
that I was in ER and I had to be on the call with our board and on the uh, using the other hand to um, help my dad. And several times I had to excuse myself from the board meeting to talk to the doctors because they came to check on my dad. And my husband was in a startup and then he start, also started his own company. So it was just a mess. And I also realized in looking back, there was a period of time I started getting lots of friends. And uh, now I realize it was because my life looked to them was so miserable that every time they talk to me, they feel much happier about their own life, they, which they thought was horrible, but compared to mine, they feel much better. But actually, when I look back, I feel that was some of the, that was my happiest time. Even though I was super busy, I was um, dropping balls all over the place. The goal at that time was not was not wasn't not to drop balls but how to drop less balls or which balls to drop but i think at that time all our team members my partners including myself we were very happy and driven because we had lots of hope and dream uh, for this bright future even though naively because we had no idea what we were marching into so the message here I'm trying to share is, if a person like me can do it, you can do it. It doesn't have to be a startup. It can be anything in your life, anything you dreamed of. Even though you might not have all the perfect conditions, you might not be ready, but just start it today, give it a try, just keep working on it. You'll be good at it. There are lots of myths about startups. And only when you go through the journey itself, you realize how wrong these myths are. So some people start a company to be cool, to um, something to brag about. But actually, it turns out, I think the easiest thing to do to be a CEO is to spend a couple of hundred dollars, register a company, just print out a business card, name yourself CEO. And I remember back at uh, Cisco days when I travel uh, to different places, everybody knows C Cisco. But when we started Zingbox, every time I travel and people ask me, where do you work at? I said, oh, I work at Zingbox. Every time people's reaction is, what box? They have never, ever heard of it. And to do startup, you have to face lots of rejections. Many, many investors would say no to your proposal. Many customers will say no to your product before you can land on the first customer. And the second one is the myth is you can get rich from startup. And turns out, at least for the first few years, it was completely the opposite. We were so short of funding, so short of money. And for our founders, for the first uh, quite period of time, we were almost not getting paid. And we had to put in some of our own money. I remember when we first moved to a new office, we didn't have a microwave and people wanted to heat up their lunch. And I just brought in my own microwave and amazingly it was still working after five years and on a business trip back at Cisco days big company wherever we go we stay at five-star hotels so super comfortable we get taxi and at the small startup we try to save every every penny we try to uh, to save money not to fly direct flight and get one hop uh, two hops and sometimes stay at family friends place or stay at motels, et cetera. I remember soon after uh, we started Zingbox, my husband was um, uh, telling me, I realize now you're making a lot less money, but you're spending a lot more because um, there are lots of things I could have done it myself. I used to do it myself, pick up kids and uh, send my parents to see doctors. Now I cannot be there. I cannot do it myself. Then I have to spend the money to get help. 
and uh, uh, basically use money to buy back time. So your expense definitely goes up. And I realized for the past several years, the stock market was doing really, really well. And lots of my friends became much, much better off. So there are many better ways, much better ways to make money. I need, need, need to mention most startup fails. I remember, I think it was the first week when we started Zingbox, a friend of mine kindly tell me, oh, by the way, I read a statistics, 99% of startups fail. I was like, great, thank you for the information. I wish I had known that before we started Zingbox. And um, actually, I think starting this company was more of an impulsive decision. I, I, I was always a very logical person, but that decision in hindsight, I see that it was a very illogical uh, decision. And only now I know that was just the beginning of making random decisions because um, in startup, you have to make many decisions and uh, not necessarily you always have the information you need. You always have the prediction. You always know Actually, you never know about the future. Now I totally understand why people are saying, oh, just follow your heart, follow your gut, because there's nothing else you can follow. Then you, that's the only thing you can do. So when we first started Zingbox, I got lots of congratulations saying, oh, now, you're, you're, now you are your own boss. But turns out very soon I realized everybody became your boss. Your investor definitely is your boss. Your team members are your boss. When your individual contributor, your engineer, it's so easy for an engineer to get another job in Silicon Valley. You can just easily fire your boss on any day. But here you're responsible for the team. You're responsible to your, to your investors. And customers are all definitely your boss. And even at home, everybody became your boss because you're not never at home. You're, you feel so, gu so guilty. And uh, whenever you come back home, you see your family members, you treat them as your boss, try to be super nice to them. And the last myth is flexibility. Another congratulation I got, oh, now you must have lots of time and you can be manage your own time. You can be so flexible. And the reality is you, Yes, you do have flexibility when to work, but the reality is you'll be able to choose choose to work any 24 hours a day you want. So now talking about advice, more like lessons learned. Two years ago, I was invited to give a welcome keynote at a banquet to a group of incoming freshmen, Stanford students and their parents. And I thought about my journey and thought about things I wish I had known when, we, uh, when, I, when, when I was younger. I summarized them in three points. And the funny thing is the next day, the Stanford professor was giving a big welcome address to welcome the new freshman students, and he talked exactly three points, even in the same order. So uh, the, the next year, which was last year, I was invited back to welcome a group of freshman uh, kids and their parents again. So it seems these three points were very well received. That's why I, I want to share these three points here too. And we all know in our car, we have a meter called uh, RPM. And I use these three acronym, uh, three letters as an acronym. And of course, they represent different things here. So first one is R, risk. I just wish I had taken more risks when I was younger. And I wish I had tried this entrepreneur journey when I was younger. I took a trip business trip to Israel. And uh, I was really amazed by this um, country and the people there. And I met many amazing people on this trip. And one common question I asked them is, how can such a small country with 
uh, so small population compared to lots of large countries. There's so many, uh, so much innovation coming out of it. So many amazing things coming out of it. People are very creative. And uh, one answer I got, I think it was very insightful, was because people there are very willing to take risks and they're not afraid of failures. They don't see failure as something to be shamed of. They, they actually, something they're very proud of, that means they had the courage to try it. I remember back in graduate school, we, one of the professors, turns out he was also the professor who wrote the first check to Google. Uh, now I don't remember any of the technical things he taught us in the class, but there's, there was one thing, there were actually two things he mentioned, I still remember today. The first one, he said, oh, when you go to the real world, C students are going to lead A students. And the second thing he said, that was many years ago when Google just started. We Nobody had ever, ever heard of uh, Google, this company. But he said in the class, you guys should check out Google. This is an amazing company. They're doing amazing things. You should um, work at Google. Well, I wish I had listened to him. Then I'll be much better off today. Uh, I didn't listen to either one of his advice. But I think his point is the C students probably I think his point is similar to taking risks, try something new. There was also a survey about on 28 valedictorians, they follow these number one high school performers for 10 years. And turns out they found to see how many of them went down to change the world, run the world or impress the world. And the answer seems to be zero. I think the reason here also, because they're such a perfect performer, there's they're such perfect performers, they're not taking enough risks. And we all know the hero of today, Elon Musk, the reason he has today's amazing achievements, one of the key reasons is he's very, very willing to take risks. So I would encourage people, younger people, just, you know, even people as senior, as old as I am, I still think I should uh, take more risks. Then that's R. Then P stands for people. It sounds like cliche, but I cannot stress enough how important people, this factor is in our life your networking skills, your communication skills, how you can surround yourself with great people. For our startup journey, I realized at the end of the day, it's not, a, a, it's not about how smart you are. It's not about how great of algorithm you have, even though I'm a technologist. It's not about how hard you work. Of course, there, you, you need to have all of these. But eventually what matters the most is how many people are willing to support you, are willing to help you, are willing to share their resource with you. The reason we could have this Zingbox journey was because we had we got tremendous amount of support and help from our investors, our partners, our team members. And if you're working in a big company, people skills, communication skills are even more important. And when, when we talk about building relationship with people, I just want to emphasize one thing here, gratitude. I want to share a very small personal story to drive this point home. Several years ago, my mom became really sick. We went to see many doctors and nobody could figure out what was going on with her. And then we heard about uh, this doctor in a really well-known clinic and we're trying to get into this clinic, but turns out this clinic doesn't accept my mom's insurance. I was very disappointed and I was talking with the front desk lady and she was super nice. I, I didn't know her at all, but she was super nice. She saw our family situation and she said, oh, let me try to talk to, I've been at this clinic for so many years and I know lots of people. Let, let me try to see if I can help. And I was very happy and grateful. Then a couple of days later, she called me, said, 
Oh, so sorry, May. We stopped taking this kind of insurance years ago. We cannot really accept your mom. I was very disappointed. But then next time I visit the um, clinic for myself, I stop by her desk to thank her. And uh, then I saw a gratitude card, the, the blank card on the desk that you can really just write a, f uh, a few words to express your gratitude. So I said, Kathy, no matter what, whether, whether my mom can come in or not, can get in or not, I really appreciate your great help. And no matter what, I'm going to write a thank you note to your management. And turns, and, and Kathy becomes so touched, it seems. And she said, May, just give me a little bit more time. Let me try again. And then several days later, she called me again, said, May, your mom is in. I was just in tears. This lady I didn't know at all was helping us so much. I think this little car makes a huge difference. Then my mom got into the clinic, was diagnosed, and was treated immediately and saved my life, saved my mom's life, and of course, completely changed my life as well. So sometimes gratitude in your life can make you can go very uh, can go very far. I don't know how much time I have. I think I'm I can go to ten fifty. So I'll I'll just continue. I like to leave some time for a Q and A. And then the last thing is mindset. I talked to a world renowned surgeon. And he encouraged me to watch a video, to watch a movie called Hidden Figures. Maybe some of you have to watch it. If not, I really encourage you to watch it. It's talking about three black scientists back 50 years ago uh, in NASA. I still clearly remember a scene. There's one of the three black scientists would, was talking to her supervisor saying, oh, based on your rules, I fulfilled all the requirements. When is my next promotion? And then the supervisor was saying, oh, uh, sorry about that. We just changed the rule yesterday. And the scientist was saying, how come every time I fulfill the requirements, you guys change the rules? So I'm trying to say here is it's very important that we all participate. Not only we understand the rules, we need to participate actively, proactively into the rule setting to the rules of the game. And you don't have to be high in a high level position in order to do that. I just give you a very simple, uh, small example happened at Zingbox. We were very fortunate to join the internship program, international students internship, where we can hire some international students to come to work at our company for a year. And we we're very fortunate to get this um, uh, student from Hong Kong who's very smart, brilliant and committed. And you would think, and she, and he flew all the way to Silicon Valley. It was his first time uh, to Silicon Valley. He had so many issues and visa issues and uh, work permit and had to find a place to live, etc. But a couple of weeks into, uh, after he started working at Zingbox, he sent us a document. He summarized all his experience how to get visa, how to fly over here, how to settle here, etc. All this paperwork, all this process in the document. And turns out that has become our handbook for interns ever since. And because his proactive attitude and take actions beyond his own responsibilities, he put himself into a much more influential position. So Lots of things, it's about how we set our mindset. And there are a lot more uh, stories I can share later. And in terms of time, I'm going to move on to next slide. So here's something more specific about startup. If you're thinking about starting your own venture, here's some advice. First, the reality is most startup fail. And actually, only after I started working, working at uh, Zingbox, I realized, oh, most of my 
partners or founding members, they all have a spouse. They, their wives either works at Facebook, Google, uh, Amazon, all these high flying companies, and they're all here just having fun. I was the only one have to earn bread and butter and a startup is really not the place to, to make you rich or to sustain a family. So you should expect long-term pain and loneliness and expect a huge financial hit, lifestyle hit before your startup can even go anywhere. And, and I actually, given the current situation, I would expect it's even tougher to start a company, at least for a foreseeable future because of the COVID-19 situation, et cetera. And nowadays, I get, I'm getting increasing amount of emails every day looking for investment, looking for jobs, et cetera. It's not like I have any of those, but uh, the situation is actually, actually getting tougher. And if you're thinking about starting your own venture, I would encourage to talk to as many people as possible, get feedback and ident really identify your advantages because if you have a great idea, probably many other people already have that idea. And the key thing is ex execution. How can you execute fast and e efficiently? And uh, I've been advising quite a few startups and um, uh, VCs and one common problem I've seen, especially from technologists and in tech industry, lots of people have great algorithms, have great technologies, but they don't know what the real pain points are. They don't know what real market needs are. You need to find something that people are very willing to pay. And another two things I cannot stress enough is find good partners, both at work and at home because you're going to spend probably more time with your business partners than with your family members. It's very important that you have mutual respect, you have mutual trust. And when it comes to tough decisions, when it comes to tough times, you know you have each other's back. And family, it truly takes a village, takes a whole family to march onto this commitment. And how do you test if you're ready? Are you ready for no income for three or more years and uh, with high probability of failing? And very probably after that, you have to go back to find another job. Are you ready to be rejected by everybody you talk to? Are you ready to be 24, to be on 24 seven working nonstop? Startup journey is tough but there are also lots of excitements. I think that's why, especially Silicon Valley, so many people who want to jump onto this boat. You meet with new people on a daily basis. You work on exciting new projects. You're gaining very valuable new experience and you're developing new technologies. And most important thing is you are building a better self. You're make, becoming a better person. You are uh, learning so much out of this experience. I think my time is almost up. I like to leave with these three key takeaways. The most important thing is take care of yourself and your family and even extended family, your work partners, your team members and appreciate others. Good things will come around back to yourself and follow your dream. Whatever you're passionate about, you want to give it a try, just try it, just do it. And thank you so much for your patience and for your time. If there are any questions, I'm very happy to answer them. I think I probably have a couple more minutes. And this is my contact information and welcome to connect and uh, happy to discuss. I got a question. Do you see yourself ever going back to a big company? Actually, now in Palato Networks, might not be everybody knows about it. It's a 
big company, at least a much bigger company compared to Zingbox. We had about 80 people now at Palo Alto. Networks. I think we have about eight thousand people, so it's already con considered giant company. Even though compared to Cisco, it's one tenth of the size of Cisco. I think Cisco has uh, it used to have uh, seventy thousand companies. So there are pros and cons. Startups and uh, big companies. Big companies. The greatest thing about they have plenty of resources. They can make much bigger influence. For example, we found lots of. Uh, Lots of things we want to drive. We want to push industry for IoT security. When we came out, we were like, who is Inbox? Everything we say, it takes lots of effort. But Palo Alto Networks is in a much better, much more influential position. Just give you a very quick example. We're trying to get some huge accounts before the acquisition. We couldn't even, nobody there even wanted to talk to us. And after being acquired by Palo Alto because uh, one of the key accounts is already Palo Alto Networks uh, big customer is a gigantic company. And within several weeks, we could meet with their CEO. That's how powerful and influential big companies can be. And a question about um, how do you cope with rejection and get yourself to bounce back? That's a very good question. It's very, very important. I guess after a while, you just get used to it. Being accepted would be a surprise, would be um, a winner. And I was just listening to uh, Zoom CEO's um, uh, talk at Stanford yesterday. And he was saying he was rejected eight times of visa to the US. And he was saying, oh, I plan to apply for 20 times. So eight times is a winner. So I think that's kind of mentality most entrepreneurs have because you got rejected so many times, you just take it as norm. If one time you got accepted, you celebrate, you, you, you cheer, and you're, you're happy about it.